go with the, with the final section on safety in the hierarchy. Just want to quickly recap some of the things of yesterday's tutorial and uh, lead in just to a bit of discussion about the meeting instead of coming up next week. Uh, that was on that handout um, in this is for us. So this page here at the bottom of the handwriting gives a bit of guidance about what the meeting is about next week. Um, this, there's obviously the memos on the course website that had mentioned the meetings a few weeks ago. But uh, just some of the, the purpose of the meeting is to, is to for your group to come with questions and to get an idea of your sense of progress. So that's what my goal is, is to get a sense of your progress. Your goal is to have some questions answered. So to make that meeting useful, it's 45 minutes, we need some things that you've done already. Right? And some of the expectations are that you've already looked at the flow sheets, you've drawn up a preliminary PID diagram, and started to add the basic control routes, the alarms, the SIS system, and relief. So the topics we've covered over the past four or five classes should be easy for you now to go and apply to your very small area of flow sheets. So this year we've made a change from previous years beforehand. Previous years employment of the flow sheets have been created. This year we've decided let's focus just on a small area. Each group is going to focus on their narrow, it's almost a single unit operation or two, three unit operations of your, your part of the flow sheet and do the alarms, the control systems, the SIS. We're also going to have, or should have mostly cleaned up is the economics evaluation for that. So estimating the capital costs, figuring out how you're going to estimate the capital costs is something that you should be close to wrapping up on that project. Just from a timing perspective, right? We're running uh, pretty tight here on time for the next four or five weeks before the project is due. So, in the meeting, we'll talk about the capital cost estimation, the process and uh, piping and instrumentation diagram, and the safety hierarchy. Those are the three main aspects. Next week in this class, we're going to start talking about operability, uh, how we start processes up, shut them down, why we have parallel valves, uh, how we make our processes more reliable. And so as we go through those topics over the next two, three weeks in this course, we will then apply the same class material to your project so that pretty much by the time we wrap that up, you're also wrapping up your project. So in parallel to everything we're doing in class, you're taking this material and applying it immediately to your project. And that's why the timing is intentional in that way. Any questions on that? Concerns with some of the groups? You've all booked your group meetings. You're all aware of where they're coming up now. But you say you, you pick the agenda. How do you Detailed. I don't know what you mean. Oh, a detailed agenda. So I don't want three bullet points. We want to talk about economics, safety, and and troubleshooting, or something like that. I, I want specific questions. Like these are our questions. Okay. These, uh, so structure meeting. So maybe a half a page to three quarter page bullet points that these are the topics we're talking about. So the meeting is. It's not there to waffle on and, and make up stuff as we're going, right? So I'm literally going to sit back and your group or the, uh, whoever your team has elected to be the chair of the meeting, you're chairing the meeting. I'm there to, to give any guidance and work with you, but you're running the meeting. So if you come with nothing to talk about, the meeting's only five minutes. So let's make that 45 minutes of productive time where you get, get some helpful feedback. Some of the groups will be meeting with myself um, and Dr. Marlon, some of the groups just with me. So Dr. Marlon has, has volunteered some of his time to give some guidance as well as a sort of external reviewer. So don't be intimidated by it. Dr. Marlon has a tremendous amount of insights and he's here to guide you. He's not involved in the grading process. I'd like you to forget about the grading aspect. The grading is very, very minor. The grading is really literally related to the detailed agenda and the minutes you provide. It's not about what we talk about in the meeting. And so the meeting is really a chance for both, both of us to learn and get our questions answered. Any, any other concerns? So it should be too stressful other than just the timing to get, get, the, get your agenda done. And <laughs> 
just also on yesterday's tutorial, there were some important things that I want you to go look at in your own time. So when we learn in our careers, our whole career we're going to be learning new technologies, new things. I, even myself, I still look at some of these flow sheets and I'm like, oh, that's neat, I didn't realize that before. Things I want you to go ahead, go on and look at in your own time. So some of the groups answered and asked questions of me yesterday, but not all of you did. But some of the things I want you to be aware of are things like steam traps, what are their purpose, distillation columns, why do we have differential pressure on them, the filter in the line of the going into the pump, why was that filter there and what's, it, what's its purpose. Those, all those parallel valves that we saw, we're going to see that in today's class, in fact, as well. So, so some of these questions that when you see something unusual in a flow sheet should be triggering questions, take a look and, and answer them. Okay? So it's, it's sort of extending yourself beyond what we officially covered in the tutorial. But the questions were there in the tutorial. But don't just say it's a steam trap. Figure out what, what is the steam trap actually doing? What is the principle of its operation? How big is it? How small is it? Okay. So take a look at some of those things um, in your own time while you're answering this uh, question for submission. Right. Okay, so let's uh, let's continue on with where we were last week. We're, we're sort of in this last layer of the safety system. So quick recap at the bottom, we've got our basic process control system. We've got alarms, SIS. So those are three systems that are, are automatic, they're electronic. Okay, so we looked at that uh, a, few, a few classes ago, so it's over there. And the next section we're looking at here is relief. And we started looking at this last week, and relief is totally manual. There's no electronic signaling going on here, there's nothing that can fail from that perspective. It's purely a mechanical system to ensure that we're going to build out these pressures. So anywhere where we can get a pressure build up and vacuum, we'll talk about vacuum as well, that also counts. Anywhere where we can create <coughs> this sort of situation is somewhere where we can provide relief. And obviously the most common area of relief is applied to a pressure vessel. But there's some unusual cases which also show up, and we're going to look at some of those today. So it's not just any anywhere where you see a vessel, I need relief. That's true. Um, if you can close that vessel off, you need relief on it. But there's other vessels, in quotes, unquotes, that we can also create unsafe situations on. So the first mechanism of relief we looked at was simply the relief valve, which is a spring-loaded device. And that spring's pressure down or force down is going to counteract any pressure inside the vessel. So A refers to my interior of the vessel, B refers to this piping that we take the material away with. And if A exceeds its safe operating pressure, it will counteract that spring force. So the nut up here is tightened and loosened to get it to the right pressure counteract what's going on in the vessel. So we considered that on Friday, and I showed you this as one example. So I'll pass around two brochures, they're a little bit old, but they page through them and you can quickly see sort of the types of relief valves and the variety of relief valves in them. Um, so please hand those around. So the question in yesterday's tutorial came up, what's a flange? Uh, so this is the flange over here, this metal plate that you see over here, where we attach that to the vessel, that's the flange. Here's a flange over here, we will attach it to the pipe, taking the material away, and we're going to then contain that material, or we're going to burn it in a flare, or dispose of it in some manner. Because when we relieve this vessel's contents, this material is moving up here, so it's vapor or it's liquid, and that material is typically not in a state to sell. Okay. Also, consider a process with multiple relief valves. We're going to take this material that's leaving here and carry it away and dispose of it. So if we have 20 vessels in our process and we've got each of these vessels have a relief valve on it, what we do not do, we don't go around creating 20 pipes that each have their own flare, right, or go to some other containment vessel. What we'll do is we'll join all of these <coughs> up into a single pipe or two <coughs> larger pipes in our process and then take those off 
and flare that. So recognize that this pipe is connected to other vessels potential. So if you have two vessels flaring at the same time, uh, sorry, two vessels that have pressure relief going on at the same time, one vessel is here maybe at 200 MPA, and another vessel might be at 150 MPA, they're both relieving, you can start to get cross-contamination occurring. Okay, so careful design around the relief system to prevent uh, backflow into them. Another type of relief valve, so there's two, two main alternatives. This first one over here that we considered yesterday, just for safety relief. Control valve, and then here's the burst diaphragm or rupture disc, either name. Um, what the rupture disc looks like is, let's take a look at it. It's something that, that uh, is a metal plate. It's got this sort of hemispherical shape to it, often. Okay, so this hemispherical dish shape is up here. The pressure side is down here, so the vessel is below it, and this hemispherical plate is facing up that way. Um, these lines that you see on it are score lines, and those lines and that whole device is engineered so that it will burst at a particular pressure. So you buy the burst uh, diaphragm rated for a given pressure. So the, the manufacturer will put a detailed rating there on the label telling you what that, that diaphragm will burst at. Now, you will notice here, I said there's no electronics involved in receiving this over here. Here's wiring, what's, what's up? That, why we, why we have that? Any guesses? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is inside a pipe. My burst diaphragm is instrument is is embedded inside this pipe in here. Here's my vessel A. This thing breaks. Material passes through and ruptures out. I do not know that it's broken though. There's no way to tell me that this material has ruptured. So or that that diaphragm is ruptured. So I put in a probe, <coughs> in a pressure probe or a temperature probe, something that's going to tell me and give me a value that's very different to the usual value. So when this rupture disc is closed. The temperature here should be ambient or whatever is typical in that header. If this is open, then that temperature may increase. And the pressure as well will need a very different value. So we have that there to tell us after the fact, look, you need to go and replace this. So that's obviously a disadvantage with the rupture this, is once it's broken, we need to shut our process down, close up that pipe and replace it. So if that's such a that seems such a huge disadvantage. Why would we ever use rupture discs? And we have well, what, like a control valve, a valve up here, a relief valve. Once it goes up and the pressure is relieved, it will drop back down again, and your process can keep operating. There's no time wasted over here. But a burst diaphragm seems to be pretty wasteful, right? If this thing breaks, I have to go buy a new one, and these are not cheap at all. Why, why do I do that? It'd be when you want to have your pressure go down to atmospheric instead of below uh, some high value that you believe that. Okay. So, you want to the pressure. so when this breaks open, there's a permanent path out of your vessel out to atmosphere or to whatever the, the relief system is. Okay. What does that imply? What's going to happen? If this is atmospheric out here, and then there's a high pressure in here, and this breaks, what's going to happen? Relative to this situation, where the spring is up here, it opens temporarily to leave material out, and this comes back down again. What's the delta P across there? One thing to recognize with the burst diaphragm, once it's broken, that delta P is atmospheric, this is very quickly going to get all your material out. A burst diaphragm is used for very, very rapid relief. Contrast that to uh, this relief valve, that this will relieve and stay up as long as pressure A exceeds B. And then when, sorry, not A exceeds B, as long as pressure A exceeds the spring's force coming down. So that spring is keeping it normally closed at the, at the safe operating pressure. 
But the moment A's pressure has dropped back down below that, that spring is going to reseat the valve. So the pressure inside this vessel will not drop dramatically. It will only drop to the extent of that spring's tension. So what you will get then is consider an exothermic reaction taking place. It's sort of at this, just at this unsafe level. And A's pressure is going higher and higher. It will open the valve and then close again a few seconds later. That pressure keeps building up again. The valve opens and then shuts. Opens and shuts. Opens and shuts. Just <coughs> as we're operating at that value of the valve's pressure. So we call that chattering. So the valve is doing this and it's not something we want at all. Because every time it's doing that, there's the potential that this valve will not reseat itself properly. That valve not reseating itself properly now leaves a permanent opening and you're wasting product in, and out of this vessel at the time. Even just a 1% waste might seem insignificant, but often that's that 1%, 2% of the product that's your profit margin. So some of these processes we're running really, really tight economically. Our income and our expenses are very, very closely matched. So that if you're wasting this product, you're essentially burning your profit out here with this valve. Okay, so we don't, we don't want that sort of chattering situation. We recognize we need the safety issue, but we also need to make sure it's not going to impinge on our economics. So these chattering valves are, are not, not useful. In the event that there is a problem in here, in cases where we need to get this material relieved very rapidly, we'll use a burst diaphragm. Other cases where we'll use a burst diaphragm is um, when we have corrosion occurring. So think of a corrosive fluid here. Corrosive, corrosion will impact a burst diaphragm. It will also impact a a safety relief valve of this type. So if there's corrosion occurring here, this is going to eventually leak and permanently leak material out. But on a burst diaphragm valve, should corrosion occur over there, it will corrode that open, relieve, and tell you. Okay, so you, you're permanently losing the material. You'll very quickly know about this loss, and then you can go replace it. It will fail safely. So we like that. We don't want to fail in an unsafe manner should corrosion occur. And the other reason why we really like these burst diaphragm valves is because if we're dealing with slurries or viscous materials, syrupy type consistencies, sticky material, this will get it out very quickly. Whereas, think of a slurry which is solids and liquids combined in this situation is going to potentially clog up this valve. So it may actually cause a layer to build up here that's so sticky that that valve never opens in an unsafe situation. So we can get a sort of gummy type material build up <coughs> over here, causing this pressure valve, pressure relief valve, to be able to operate. Here. So there is a there's trade-offs here to to which technology. <coughs> How do we maintain and clean these valves? Okay. How would you maintain clean these? So this is a safety system. Recall Three Mile Island where they overrode the safety systems. Hiroshima as well. Hiroshima was an overriding of the safety systems. And then the accident occurred at that time. How would you maintain safety? <laughs> okay, so plant shutdowns. Every year or two, we'll shut our process down. What happens during those plant shutdowns? We hire, if you're working at any of these sites, you'll see a ton of contractors coming. Because you shut the process down for two weeks, you will bring in entire crews, and some of those crews have very specific tasks. One of their tasks is to just maintain the safety belts. Other crews will be responsible for cleaning distillation column trays. Other crews will be responsible for painting. Things that you cannot normally do um, on hot, active vessels. So safety relief valves are, are some of those things where, where we do need to test them periodically. But we, like this sort of valve, one way we can test it is using this hand cranker over here. So this 
that, that crank over there will allow you to go lift up the, the spring and test that the relief flows <coughs> from, from the right over there. So you can check that there's been any uh, uh, buildup of material over there and, and, and check whether that valve actually works. But a burst diaphragm cannot be tested. Okay? There's no, no way of testing a burst diaphragm at all. Um, really. Okay, so one other thing just to bear in mind is that these regular relief valves, they'll be used when we're dealing with pressures of about 20,000 PSI and lower. Okay. The burst diaphragm valve can be used at far higher pressures. So that's another instance of a very high pressure Okay, so let's take a look at some of the symbols you'll see on the flow diagrams. That's the symbol for the safety relief valve that's spring loaded. And that triangle over here tells us where we send the material. So if we go to a flare or to go somewhere to contain it. Okay, so I, I won't go through this one, it's in the notes. The relief valve on that flash drum we've considered um, several times this flash drum flow sheet. There's, a, there's an enclosed vessel here that we can build up the pressure on. We need relief on that vessel at some point. And we typically put it up at the top for the vapor to be released and then go and send that to flaring. Here yeah, I'd just like to take a look at this interesting case. Um, we don't always need to flare or waste our product. If, we're, if we need to relieve it, we can do something else with it. So consider this case first got a tank filled with liquid material, a positive displacement pump. What do we know about positive displacement pumps? Okay, what if this valve down here is shut? <laughs> Well down here is shut, you're going to have a very short pump line. Okay, so the pump's mechanism is, and you can take a look at some of these diagrams, so essentially a positive displacement pump, this is moving up and down, this is like a piston in your car engine, and it's on the downward stroke, it's pushing this material, closing that valve, and forcing it up over there. On the upward stroke, this is opening, allowing new fluid into this chamber and then on the downward stroke that fluid will get pushed out. Okay. So there's there's several alternatives to a positive displacement pump. I've shown those over there for you to look at those diagrams in your own time. But what we're referring to is if we put a valve over here and that valve is closed, you're going to burst this area because this pump is this piston is moving up and down and you're going to cause a very, very unsafe pressure buildup. So that pressure will build up very rapidly in, in this chamber and it will burst. Um, here's another mechanism of a positive displacement pump using a set of gears to force material through the pipe or a low pump um, material flowing in here gets, gets trapped in this interior chamber and forced through. So if we put a valve and shut this stream here, again, we're going to build up a very very rapid pressure increase because this material is still coming in. There's nowhere to go. Water or liquids are not compressible and that will, will cause an unsafe situation. So then the question is then, why even put that valve on? If we know that this is an unsafe situation, why would we even put a valve downstream of that pump? <coughs> So we definitely need a valve. Uh, if we didn't have a valve here, and there's a height of fluid in this tank, so this is several meters high, no valve here, this 
can start the pump at make, causing flow to occur. So even though you've turned the pump off, those gears are not necessarily static. That head of fluid in the pump may force the material through the pump anyway, and the pump is off. So we need valves to isolate these units. But you can see what we're, we've created an unsafe situation. In the same way that in a pressure vessel, in a flash vessel, you can build up a high pressure, here you can build up a pressure in this piping. Okay, so there, just that segment over there is potential for high pressure with nowhere for it to go. So we need to provide relief. What type of relief would we provide? Burst diaphragm. the spring-loaded valve will work quite nicely, but what we can do then is instead of wasting that material and flaring it, we can recycle it back to our tank to reuse it. So this, this material that's passing through here is the same consistency, same, same quality material, so instead of just wasting it, feed it back to reuse. So if someone inadvertently goes and shuts that down, all you're really doing is just wasting energy. You're not creating an unsafe situation. So we already answered that question, why do we have all those valves? So that's not what we're focusing on. But consider this situation. What, what is the potential here for an unsafe situation, firstly? What's unsafe here? And secondly, what are you going to do about it? There's heat exchanges pretty much in all of our flow sheets. Right? So this is guaranteed something we're going to see. What is the unsafe potential? And what are you going to do about it? So take a few minutes and talk about that. Figure out the solution. you bypass the heat exchanger without turning off the hot fluid, it's just going to build up heat. Right. So there's nothing taking the heat away. Okay, so this valve open, this valve closed, this valve closed, this valve open, material is coming through here, leaving. Okay, so it's not getting heated, but there's existing material in this piping here on the shell side. So this is the shell side. This hot fluid is coming in on your tubes, leaving cooler. Now you've got this hot stream keep going, building up heat, 
what if this fluid is a hydrocarbon that's being heated, liquid phase typically, leaving liquid, entering liquid phase, leaving liquid phase, but it's hotter. Now you've got this build up of heat. Energy accumulating, you're vaporizing this material in the shelf side, vapor expands very, very rapidly, and you have a problem in the hands. <coughs> so what's the, what's the, what can we do? It's not a trick question. What do we do? You've got this potential for pressure buildup in a heat exchanger. It's a closed vessel. You relieve it. So we add relief to the shell side of the heat exchanger and then flare that. So those hand valves over here allow us to isolate the heat exchanger for good reasons. For maintenance, sometimes we need to clean out this heat exchanger. But if someone comes by and closes these valves by mistake in the wrong sequence, we're going to get this, this uh, unsafe situation occurring. We need to provide a mechanism for relief on the shell side. Not just that, other, there's several other unsafe situations that can occur here. Well, one other one is if there's hot fluid mixing here and the material on the other side, on the shell side, so the hot fluid comes in on the tube side, the other material is on my shell side. Heat exchanges fail if there's holes develop in corrosion. Now you've got this fluid streams mixing and there's potential for, whatever, depending on those fluid streams, <coughs> that you've got hot fluid mixing with this other, there could be a reaction occurring, but even if there's no reaction, just that excessive heat um, can lead to, <coughs> to uh, problems and we need to provide a mechanism to relieve it. So heat exchangers are enclosed vessels. Same as tanks, same as flash vessels, same as distillation columns. Anything where we've got an enclosure, which is pretty much most vessels we deal with in <coughs> years, can, and even just pieces of pipe. A piece of pipe is a reactor. A piece of pipe is a pressure vessel, okay? So any one of those, we need to consider when an unsafe situation can occur and provide a mechanism for relief. Here's something to think about. We'll see this sometimes on certain processes. We have our vessel, high pressure over here. We have a burst diaphragm, okay? We like burst diaphragms for the reason we've said already. They work at high pressure. They relieve really rapidly for us. We have a pressure indicator. We've already talked, spoken about that. Why is this pressure indicator here? And then we have a safety relief valve after that. Why do we have two in series? You have a relief diaphragm first and then your regular pressure relief valve on a spring. Why two in series? Think about the situations where that could be useful. Why would we have two in series? Pressure relief valve and out. 
that pressure comes back to normal, this valve closes, the burst diaphragm is still open and ruptured, but your process can continue on running. So that's a great advantage. Any other reasons? because we get really rapid relief because on this side we have atmospheric. But now once this, the second valve is here, I don't have that advantage anymore. So I lose that, but I'm getting this great advantage that I can still keep operating. So what else, where else might I use this type of situation? So we're willing to make that one trade-off to get continued operation, is what we're saying. But what other situations might we use this unit to? Think of what's inside here. It's not always vapor, it's not always liquid. Would this prevent against backflow from other different processes? No. It would prevent against, uh, prevent against backflow, but we, that the diaphragm would have prevented against backflow on its own. But after it burst, you have two different vessels? Yeah. And then you have football to one point where? So backflow would be prevent by having one-way valves in our in our headers and manifolds. So we, sh we wouldn't be considering this as an option for yeah. It's redundancy. So if like your burst diaphragm corrodes through or something, and it's not a, an intended failure, then it's not going to invent the whole process because it's old or needs okay. to be replaced. So if there's, it's a redundancy. So if there's corrosion occurring here, you'll still have that safety in place after it. Not just corrosion is one example. Think of things like the viscous fluids and sticky materials that build up over on a regular pressure relief valve, they could cause that valve seat to just clog up and the valve would never open ever. Okay. But with this burst diaphragm, this is providing a protective layer for that valve up here. So a burst diaphragm, sure, if material builds up on the inside, it doesn't matter. It will still, when the pressure is exceeded, it will still burst out. But we've been that all these years that this that material has built up over here and built up that sticky layer is not going to affect the integrity of the pressure relief valve as the second step. Okay, so viscous fluids, corrosive fluids, anytime we were dealing with material that can cause this valve, the pressure relief valve up here to get damaged and lose its integrity, we'll protect that valve with an initial burst diaphragm. So that's, uh, that's over here, um, so sticky material is the main, main situation. Now once this pressure relief valve is closed, uh, sorry, this uh, burst diaphragm has burst open, this valve will shut after the pressure is relieved, and this pressure indicator here will read a high pressure, because this is essentially reading the, the pressure in the vessel. It's now opened up, we're going to just read that PI value, and that PI value is going to tell me that the burst diaphragm has, has opened up. I can then schedule maintenance at some point in the future, in the near future, to replace that burst diaphragm. So that's a, a good warning signal. And then one other type of uh, uh, safety relief valve we need to consider is not just overpressure, but we also need to consider vacuum. So you've seen, how many of you have seen, you've seen photos of wineries or breweries? You see these big shiny silver tanks. Right? We're used to seeing those in, in these clean, clean type environments. One, what's the, the cleaning process for that is to spray hot water into that vessel. So lots of hot water soak the solution, you wash out the hot water, <coughs> you've got a hot atmosphere in there now. If you close those valves on that vessel and that material, the air in there starts to cool down and contract, you're going to crumple that vessel in. You're going to pull that vessel into it. You're going to build a vacuum up in the vessel. So it's quite easy. In fact, it's far easier to crumple a vessel in than it is to explode it. 
very, very easy to pull it in and, and ruin that vessel. Um, vessels have great integrity from an expansion point of view. They have almost no integrity from a, a contraction point of view. So very easy to cause this vessel to buckle in. So what we'll do is we'll put a safety relief valve that behaves essentially the opposite mechanism so that this will pull up when this vacuum inside here is too high, this will pull up allowing an inert atmosphere or air to come into the vessel. Okay, so to balance out that vacuum and relieve the vacuum. Very careful here what you choose to put in this vessel. So if this vessel contains explosive material under vacuum, you need to ensure that the air that you're going to introduce here does not contain oxygen. So you need to make sure that there's a nitrogen stream available here, some inert gas, so that what you're bringing into your vessel will not cause an explosion after that. Okay, so very, very careful engineering about around the vacuum relief valve as well, in terms of your choice of vapor to introduce into the vessel. Some other things that, uh, that we've, we've seen, I've seen this before, we, we often uh, work, work in companies where we're dealing with explosive materials. So, common example, shaving cream, uh, deodorant cans, these pressurized little cans that you produce with some sort of liquid in it, both gas, the propellant, is flammable. Okay, we've all done that in all experiments where you burn the material coming out of a little deodorant can. With, Companies that manufacture this, the walls on their company are explosive, or oh, walls that will allow an explosion to be relieved. Okay, so if you ever do a tour at Xerox in the society, their walls on their site are made to open out and allow an explosion to vent. Okay, so we don't want to send these bricks and the wall structure flying into our neighbors. We want that wall to just fall open. So we engineer that wall to fall open or, or lift up in some way to relieve that, that, that explosion. And obviously you don't go build a parking lot here or put it next to the high school or primary school. So you put it in an area where there's no people, allowing that relief to occur in that situation. Okay. Now let's talk about the next step. Once we've relieved, we need to deal with the material. Okay, so the most common is to flare it. Um, in, in some way, but you can also vent it to the environment. Things like steam and high pressure pressurized air can easily be relieved to the environment with no hazard there. You can contain the material for later treatment. You can recycle it. We saw an example of that earlier. Um, <coughs> you can be able to recover it and feed it back to some beginning part of the process to reuse, or you can flare it. So flaring is essentially just a flare is a flame a chemical reaction, you're essentially just neutralizing that hydrocarbon and converting it to carbon dioxide and water vapor. So you're neutralizing your material in some way. So you'll often see a, a, it's not just your reactor hooked up to the flare. So when you see two flare on your flow sheets, recognize that there's multiple steps between that reactor and the flare. One of the first things is we may send it through a cyclone. We like cyclones because there's no electricity required to operate them. So the moment this stream leaves, at high velocity, we can cyclone it out and separate any liquids from the vapor. So that's the first separation. Drop my liquids down here, let the vapor continue on. I may be able to recover that liquid stream. We also don't want to send liquid over to our, our flare. Uh, we may need to scrub some obnoxious chemicals out there, so any toxins that won't, that won't get neutralized in the flare, they need to be scrubbed out, so there may be chemicals in that, well, there will be chemicals in that scrubber to neutralize the maximum flow of material. So Bopel, recall they had one of these in place, but the day or the days leading up to the accident, they had that out of commission with not enough solvent in there to take up the toxin. So it's no good having a scrubber here on standby with a, a, a low amount of solvent to pick up what you're trying to remove. So that needs to be appropriately sized. We then send it to a seal pot where we remove water again. 
uh, so bubble your, your, your vapor and potentially a bit of liquid in here through a liquid stream, the vapor rises and that's what we send to the flare. So the, I will post this article, or I have posted it to the course website. I will ask you to read it in your own time. It's uh, very, very easy to read, four or five pages, there's no equations, very descriptive, explaining what flares do. And some of the things I want you to take a look at is um, in that reading, why would we build flares that are, are surrounded by an enclosure? Okay, so the answer is there in the figure caption. Um, I'd like you to take a look at why we might inject steam into a flare. So it sounds counterintuitive. You're taking steam, injecting it into a flare. What is the reason for that? Okay. Think of it along the lines that that's a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction over there requires oxygen. If this is a very small flame, you're not getting a lot of oxygen coming in. You need this mass transfer coming to the flame. If we don't have oxygen coming to the flame, we get something that looks like this. We get a very terrible flame, and our neighbors complaining, and the city fining us. Okay, so this is a flame that's not got enough oxygen. So we will use steam to create a very long flare. The very long flare allows you to have an extended mass transfer area, so you now get more oxygen coming in. So in the article, it's referred to as momentum transfer, where you, you, you have to make sure that flame has enough momentum so that it's elongated and can burn with enough oxygen coming into it. There's also other reasons for using steam, and I'd like you to read the article for that. I'd like you to look up what a molecular seal is doing. Okay. Why do we have a molecular seal? What's its purpose? Why do we have a liquid seal? And why do we have a knockout draft? So take a look at those aspects. The article is very, very easy to read. gives you a voice. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll start a slightly different topic next class.